better understand. What's that, Brett? Turn my off. On, it is. <laughs> Can you all hear me okay? All right, great. Welcome. Again, uh, Cultural Thursday is the monthly cultural literacy program here at Central Lakes College where we invite people from around the world to help us better understand the diverse people, perspectives, and places of our incredible planet. My name is Jason Edens, and it's my privilege to coordinate the Cultural Thursday program here at Central Lakes College. And I want to welcome all of you, and I also want to welcome all the folks that are joining us online. We have a number of high school and a number of community members that are also joining us virtually at this point, too. So welcome to all of you. It's also my privilege to introduce our speaker today. It is Kari Frisch. Kari Frisch is one of our esteemed colleagues here, one of our esteemed instructors at Central Lakes College, and she spent part of her sabbatical in Greece. So without further ado, please welcome Kari Frisch. Thank you, Jason. Um, everybody able to hear me okay? All right, awesome. I'm a theater major, so um, hopefully you'll be able to hear me. Uh, I'm going to start with just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Kari Frisch, and as I said, I am a theater major. Uh, once a theater major, always a theater major, as some of my friends have told me. But really, I teach communication courses here at Central Lakes College. And as Jason said, I was fortunate enough to be on sabbatical this past year. And as part of my plan, I included a trip to Greece. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, my trip and with the preface that I knew there was a lot about Greece when I started researching it and when I put it into my plan. There's a lot to see, to do, to to know, to learn. So I signed up for a professional tour because I needed somebody who was going to be able to provide everything that I wanted to get out of my trip. So this is our group and our professional tour guide, Eleni, who was from the city. I went on, had all over uh, Greece and the mainland and a couple of islands. So we went to Athens, Naphleon, Olympia, Delphi, Kalambaka, Meteora, Athens, back to Athens there, and then we that's where we got on the cruise ships to go to Mykonos and Santorini, or the ferries, I should say, not cruise ships. But uh, So this is going to kind of be my outline for today. And uh, knowing that what our itinerary was going into it, I also knew that there was going to be a lot more to Athens that I wanted to see that the tour did not include. So we actually went a couple of days early and added additional things into the itinerary. Okay, so as I said, I knew there was a lot to Greece. So I ended up with a lot of things on my to see list. You can see there the list is pretty long, but we did really well. We got to all, all but one of those places and we did it in two and a half days. Yeah, so that was about 35 miles of walking by the time we left Athens. We saw a lot, and now here I am trying to condense 17 days of a whirlwind trip and 5,000 plus years of history into a 50-minute presentation. You can't do it. So those of you that are tech savvy, here's a QR code to another part of my sabbatical project, which was a blog about my research heading into Greece, as well as a, kind of a journal, a diary of what happened while we were there. And after I came back, I added additional resources, links, tips, and a link to a photo stream for the day of just the highlights. I mean, I have thousands and thousands of pictures. I promise it might seem like I shared all of them in that little link, but I didn't. I selected photos. Um, and I'll pop up this QR code at the end of the presentation again, too. Or if you want uh, the direct link, you'll get my email address at the end. Feel free to email me, and I will email you the direct link to my blog. Oh, did you see the name of it? Opa, my big fat Greek sabbatical trip. Okay, so uh, in the time that I do have, I'm gonna do my best to share what I can. So buckle up and enjoy my majestic Greece. Our first stop in Athens was the Panathenaic Stadium. It is a spot where the Panathenaic Games took place back in ancient Greece, but they became revitalized uh, with the rebirth of the modern day Olympics in 1896. There are some specific features about the stadium that make it stand out. It is made entirely of white marble, and you can see the steps are kind of steep there at a few spots. Um, and uh, again, because there's so much history there and I knew I couldn't 
trust my memory to, to remember everything, we did do an audio tour. So if you're ever in Athens and you want to check out the stadium, which I hope you do, make sure that you get that audio tour because it walks you around the stadium and even brings you into through the athletic tunnel where like thousands of ancient and modern athletes have walked to come out into the stadium. This tunnel leads you to a museum that uh, kind of talks about the different uh, Olympics and even includes a poster from each of the Olympics and the torch that was used for that year. So the museum itself is uh, really fascinating and I want to point out, oh I could use my fancy little laser thing. This is the device that is used in the ceremonies to actually light the torches. Um, so you'll see a picture of that later in the slides, but I just kind of wanted to point that out now. Um, so the stadium again is open. You can walk or run uh, along the, the track and field area there and even stand on the podium. So for us, it was a really great first stop. Yeah, so really my first stop was food. I'm a big foodie, so um, I had to get a Slovakia sandwich. If uh, you might know them as heroes, uh, there's different kinds of meats, but they are fabulous and so yummy. So uh, the particular place that I chose to go, oh, again, the laser over here is a little hard to see. Ocostas, it is a famous little hole in the wall, but it is so popular that they sell out of meat, usually before noon or one. We got there about two, and they were down to like one type of meat left. But we at least got it before they closed. So if you are in Greece and in Athens and you see this little building, Make sure that you head that direction and pick up a Slovakia sandwich. Um, I like this picture on the far right here because it's also kind of, to me, that uh, dichotomy of old and new, the hotel that's built up right around this uh, old church. <coughs> Uh, we also went to Aristotle's Gymnasium or Lyceum. We passed by it on our way to Lycabetus Hill. And this, of course, is a famous spot where Aristotle kind of tutored his students. And uh, in case it's been a long time since you've had your philosophy class, sorry, Susan Bentley, I think you're watching today. So um, I did put up a little acronym because I kind of got the three great Greek philosophers mixed up. But if you think of SPA, you can uh, it might help you remember the order. Socrates uh, was the teacher of uh, Plato, who was the teacher of Aristotle, and a bonus is that Aristotle tutored Alexander the Great. So a um, lot of modern uh, Western civilization ideas and debates and free thinking came from some of these early Greek philosophers and places like the gymnasium and the lyceum um, Plato had his and Aristotle had this area. We didn't get back here because we ran out of time, but at least I got a, a photo of it. And Gandhi uh, was nearby this area on our walk. And uh, since my fellowship in India, um, I had to include him too, because again, I think the philosophies of the idea and celebrating advances um, for Western civilization and for all of us um, is kind of cool. So. Uh, as I said, we were on our way to what was, is called Lycabetus Hill. It is a very high point in Athens, so we had to climb a lot of stairs. Um, so in between each block, uh, there's like the, these segments of stairs that would probably be similar to, if, if you're from Brainerd, the parking lot that goes up to the high school. I mean, like that's how many stairs are in between just two roads. So it's seriously a lot of steps, but it's totally worth it. You get up to the top and you have a beautiful 360 view of the city of Athens. You can see in the middle picture, the Acropolis there, and uh, on the right, the Panathenaic Stadium, again, which which is where we had just been like an hour before. So a um, beautiful spot. There's also a restaurant up there. But uh, we kind of hung out waiting for the sun to set near St. George Church up here, uh, where there's a beautiful bell tower and, of course, the blue-capped uh, dome cathedrals and cats. If you don't know this, there are a lot of roaming cats in Greece. In fact, they have their own Facebook page. So if you're a feline fan, check out their Facebook page. Like I said, it was a beautiful spot to watch the sunset and a great way to end the night. Okay, once again, this is how we really ended the night with food. Um, food is fantastic. 
The next day, and another thing that if you go to Athens, you might want to include in your itinerary, is the Holocaust Memorial. It's not very big, but again, we think of Athens as ancient and classic and like 5,000 years ago. Um, but there are a lot of things to its history that we need to remember as well, including um, the more quote unquote recent events, including uh, Holocaust and those affected. So this memorial, um, again, really quick to uh, pass by, but important to take that moment to reflect upon. Our first stop for our first full day in Athens was Kiramikos, which is a cemetery and in ancient times was also where a lot of potters lived because the Eridanus River flowed right through that area. So it was rich with clay so they could work and live in this area. And in fact, Kiramikos in Greek um, is where we get the term ceramics. So um, a deep connection, but again, a very large complex and a lot of important features there. So. Uh, not only can you see some of the reliefs and the grave markers that are still around, but you'll also see um, and learn about the history having to do with the sacred way and the uh, large gates because this was kind of on the edge of town. So when people came for the Panathenaic Games, they had to stop and rest and refresh. And so there was even a fountain house and a place where they could uh, bathe and clean up a little bit or get ready for the big parade that would lead down the sacred way to the Acropolis for the Panathenaic Games. Uh, there was also a famous road that led to Plato's Academy from here. But you'll also see a, a, like a avenue of tombstones and reliefs as well as on the far right here, even some remains of old kilns because again, this is where a lot of the potters worked and lived. But today you'll see olive trees, cats, and tortoises tortoises. There's a lot of turtles there for some reason. But um, the other thing that we saw frequently or at least learned about um, was that because there's so much that's still being uncovered and still being uh, preserved in Athens that you'll see some people working, but really there's not enough time or money to do all that's there. So they know that there is a lot more that they can uncover, but um, it's hard to try and keep things preserved. But when you stop and think about how old everything really is, it's amazing that this much is still there for us to see 5,000 years later, in some cases 5,000 years. Uh, another big piece of Athens that some people kind of miss if you don't stop to take time to kind of explore more than the Acropolis is the Athenian Agora, um, sometimes also called the ancient Agora. And again, we're talking like 5,000 years of history here, but it really was the spot in Athens, Greece. It is where uh, people would go to sell their wares, to buy their goods. They would go for religious purposes, for political reasons. This really is like the birthplace of democracy. Um, and oftentimes, again, it's not included in tours unless you have uh, extended time in Athens. And there's a lot of famous people that um, are known to have kind of reflected upon their ideas or helped each other advance their ideas. Um, the famous philosophers, Pythagoras, the mathematician, Hippocrates, who is, let's see it, what you guys remember from uh, your history, modern or the father of what? Medicine, woohoo, somebody knew, okay. Um, famous public speakers, uh, politicians, and of course Greek uh, poets or playwrights. A piece of the Athenian Agora is called the Stoa. That was actually like the marketplace. It was built so that people could get a little bit of relief from the sunshine that uh, it gets so hot. So the Stoa uh, was actually reconstructed by the Classical Studies School. Um, in 1953, it took them three years to do, and it now holds the Agora Museum. And in the museum, you can find all sorts of beautiful pieces of artwork such as these marble statues of goddesses, Nike, Artemis, Aphrodite, almost any god or goddess um, is, is in there. But you also have personifications of famous things that you might recognize from your uh, English classes, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Of course, you'll also find lots of ceramics and vases that again represent different time periods. And I like the little uh, kid chamber, uh, like. I don't know if you would call it a kid seat or a chamber pot, but you know, pretty cool. A uh, couple other thing, fun facts that I found at the museum, the Astraka, which if you found somebody really annoying, 
All you had to do was like write their name on a piece of clay, and once a year, the person with the most votes actually got kicked out of the city. And that's where we get the term ostracized from. You actually got kicked out. Um, here are some that got votes in the early days. Uh, passports. Who would have thunk they had passports way back then? Uh, this is a randomizing jury selection machine. Crazy, like our early day computers. Um, and this one as a speech instructor caught my eye, the clepsydra, which is a water clock. So these bowls would have a hole in the bottom and were exact like measurements to have six minutes of running water. So the water would run out. You could, again, Greek being uh, known for democracy and free speech, uh, you could speak, but you were limited. So you had six minutes and six minutes exactly when the wet water ran out, you were done cut off. Um, and of course, Greek theater as a theater major, comedy and tragedy masks um, have a lot of symbolism for me. So speaking of the theater, another big piece of the ancient agora is the Odeon of Agrippa. Now this is kind of a later theater, but still this would be the spot during the day, classic time, when a lot of people would just meet in the agora and go there for entertainment or for cultural festivals or to see a play or to hear um, in their day what would have been a musical concert or performance. So again, there was a lot to these places and represented different time periods. And this is probably one of the coolest parts of the Agora. It's the Temple of Hephaestra. It is probably the most preserved temple, at least in Athens, if not in all of Greece. There is a lot to it where a lot of the other ones were destroyed in invasions or um, uh, just destroyed in war. Uh, this one is still in pretty good shape which you can see my note there, like, duh, he was the god of craftsmanship. So reasons it should still be standing. Uh, the Tholos and Buletarion is kind of, again, tied to Western civilization, the birthplace of democracy. This is kind of like the assembly house, our council, the Senate, uh, being able to have a people's person represent you in how decisions were made and in the public affairs of the day. That was a pretty new idea, and we can attribute it here to the Agora. So big pieces of uh, ancient history that still influence us today. I want to point out this is kind of a 3D replica of what the Agora might have looked like. So you can see it's a very large area. The stoa on the far left. Um, the uh, temple, I think, is in the back there, kind of up in the middle. And behind that, you can kind of see the Acropolis even. Um, but I also wanted to include this slide because this 3D Athens, Ancient Athens 3D, is a really cool website that gives you an idea of what things looked like in the day. And it was really helpful for me to kind of look at that before we went and also even after. So I kind of wanted to put that out there for you. And as the quote says, the ideas and philosophies born in the Agora have literally shaped the modern world. World. The Agora was a provenance of, for life-altering principles for which Western civilization is forever indebted. So I thought that was kind of a nice way to end the section on the Agora. Also in Athens, um, again, there is just, there's so much. This is why my list was so long. Hadrian's library. Hadrian was a Roman emperor sent to kind of take care of that territory, but he was known to be a Grecophile or somebody who appreciated uh, Greek culture. So you'll see he kind of advanced a lot of the preservation and spent money uh, establishing things that we can still see today. And again, the library is not just a library like we think of it today. It was a gymnasium, it was a uh, spot to uh, exercise your body and your mind, and there are still some really cool artifacts and some cool old mosaics over time. Um, there was like a bathhouse involved there, um, and again, uh, just some of the artifacts that are still around, is, it's amazing to think about how old these things are. And of course, the auditorium, an auditorium where, again, the idea was not just to store and document um, ideas, but to share in advance. So I kind of included the auditorium because I thought, here it is, here's an auditorium from, I don't know, 3,000 years ago, and here I am in an auditorium today. We can thank the Greeks for that. Okay, so also in uh, Athens is the Roman Agora, different from the ancient Agora, a different section developed more under Roman rule, and it is famous for some of the first public latrines. 
Okay, that part is true, but really what it's most famous for is this feature called the Tower of Winds. It's a water clock that used to have a weather vane. It's octagonal, and it was designed because the thought was that the winds could tell our future. So the eight different directions of the wind, like on a compass, um, and it used water to help tell time. Um, again, this is still our first full day. Now you can see why we walked 34 miles, right? Um, there are three famous hills, but they're all pretty close together. So if you get to one, you might as well do them all. Hill of Muses, the Nyx, and Hill of Nymphs. So the Hill of Muses is now like laid out with beautiful trails, but it's got a couple of features, including this, the prison of Socrates. Socrates was banned, and he actually died in prison. Now, they kind of think that this probably really isn't where he's may have been uh, banished, but um, it was kind of known to be a possibility, so the name kind of stuck. Um, but we do know for a fact, I don't know if you can kind of see in this bottom one here, you'll see like little uh, spots in the wall. They used this cave to hide antiquities during the war. So they do know that, that it was used for that. They're not quite positive about the Socrates, but again, important because we have some of the antiquities that we do, the artifacts, because they were smart enough to hide them in the caves and try and, and protect them that way. Um, at the top of the Hill of Muses is, I'm going to, mess up this name, I'm so sorry. Philippopos Monument, I do pretty well considering Greek is, it's all Greek to me, that's what Jason wanted me to title my um, uh, presentation, and really there's a lot to that. But the Philippopos Monument is a, a landmark that you can see from a lot of different spots in Athens, and it also, once again, gives you beautiful views of the city and the sea, and here is the Acropolis, and to the right, Lycabetus Hill, where we had just been the night before. Um, again, I mentioned there were three hills, the Nyx. Again, as a speech person, this has some significance for us because this is a spot where a lot of people, famous orators, would give uh, speeches and talk from what was called the orator's bima. It was a land feature that gave you elevation, um, but also had a wide area so it could fit a lot of the masses. And again, this was kind of a relatively new idea, like free speech, come in here, come and debate. Um, and so it has a, a special place, but very few people actually go there because everybody goes to the Acropolis, which you really need to do that. But um, these things have significance as well. And here's another landmark where people, a lot of people walk right by. Um, this is on Arapagos Hill. A lot of people go there, but they miss this little plaque. This little plaque is on this spot because it, this is the spot that it said that Apostle Paul addressed the Greeks. And so in Acts 17, 22 through 23, is kind of uh, the record of what he supposedly said. And so in Greek is Acts 17, 22 through 23. But again, um, if a lot of people do Christian pilgrimages, this might be on there, but otherwise a lot of uh, people just walk past this and might not even think about that. But again, like the cross of relevance of Athens and Greece to a lot of people's uh, history in, in one like little spot. Uh, Arapagos Hill is really close to the Acropolis, and in fact, they say it's so close you can almost reach out and touch it. So again, that was our first full day in Athens, a beautiful place to stay, watch the sunset, and kind of see everything come to life. Um, and here is the Temple of Hephaestus, so you can kind of see now the significance of how much of that temple still remains. And on the left, you'll see the stoa um, being uh, on the far right there, I guess, the big white building is the stoa. Um, so again, just a, a beautiful place. So uh, another spot that uh, I think Zela and Constantine, you might be out in Zoom land uh, paying attention or watching the presentation. So thanks to our friends um, who have Min State connections and Constantine is from Greece. Uh, they recommended this new museum in the Golden Hall Mall. It is not in the touristy area. We had to take a subway a ways out of town and then uh, catch a free little trolley bus to get to the entrance but totally worth it. I don't, Diane um, and I, I, I think you might agree, this is probably one of our highlights of the entire trip. Um, it's a beautiful museum that covers everything from ancient games and explaining things like the Disc of Truth and why maybe there is a olive wreath in, as a winner's wreath in one city and a laurel wreath in another, uh, to maybe where even the term ribbons came from in competitions. The original winners of the Olympic Games 
uh, would get ribbons that they would wear. Um, so it wasn't like you got, you got the fame and the glory, right? But you didn't get medals until much later. So um, again, just really kind of cool. It's very interactive. There's a lot of spots where I wasn't sure if I could take pictures, so I didn't until later. But really, uh, online, if you go to my blog, there's a link to the museum. It is amazing. And again, if you're in Athens, it's worth an Uber or a subway drive out there because it's got everything from ancient to modern and in fact again they have a poster and the torch from every single game as well as artifacts like so here is a jersey from the Sarajevo games um, and a silver medal from I think this one was from Paris. It also has some fun facts which again I wasn't anticipating we were going to take that much time but it was fun to read all of these. So for example like the first time women competed in the modern day at uh, Olympics. Gold, silver, and bronze medals weren't awarded until 1904. Um, even they would include things like when the first photo finish was used, or the first winter games, the first time national anthems were played as the athletes stood on the podiums, and the first uh, black athletes that won a medals in winter games. So it was a variety of different things, but really fun if you had the time. And again, of course, they had some really fun artifacts like the original programs from the modern games. And the far left is a, a statue of Nike. Nike was the goddess of victory. So that is what the modern day uh, athletes would win. Okay, so I had to give your brain a little break. I know that that, that was a lot there, but um, the Zapion building here uh, connects to the Olympics because this was a building that was built specifically for the 1896 Olympics. Um, and in fact, it even housed some of the competitions. The very first fencing competition was held in this building. Now it's used for more administrative type things and different things um, for the city of Athens, but has a beautiful court um, yard and pathways that you can use to get to the next big item on your list, Hadrian's Gate and the Temple of Olympian Zeus. Now I said before that Hephaestus, the Temple of Hephaestus was probably the most well preserved. The Temple of Olympian Zeus in Athens was probably the largest temple. So you can kind of see here the size of just the columns. I mean, they're monstrous, um, but not as much remains and some of the columns have fallen over, but that's kind of cool in a way too. So again, you want to make sure that you hit all of these sites. Because we're gluttons for punishment and had to keep going, we did a podcast walking tour of uh, downtown Athens, I shouldn't call it downtown, like more like the historic district. So it brought us past some Greek Orthodox Byzantine churches, uh, past Syntagma Square, which is also known as, um, oh my gosh, it just left me. Um, it's uh, Constitution Square, um, because this is where a lot of protests will happen and a lot of people, um, it's kind of like the city center now. And the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, where we got to see the changing of the guard. We also got to go, obviously, past some fun street shops and quaint alleyways, some cool markets, and through some old neighborhoods. The Plaka and the Monastiraki neighborhoods are probably terms that maybe you've heard, um, but again, one of the things that I kept just being confronted with that I found amazing were this polarization of looking one direction and seeing so much that represented the old and so much representing the new. In fact, in one of the squares, in Monastiraki Square, you can actually see the old Eridanus River, which Again, we talked about that back at the, it was on the outskirts of the city and ran from Kiramikos all the way through um, Athens, but kind of got lost and the city got built up over it. And it wasn't until the 2004 Olympics and the preparation in the late 1900s that they started building the subway systems in Athens, getting ready for the Olympics, that they rediscovered um, the, the river 
because it was right where they wanted to put the subway. So um, they preserved some of it, put like this little spot where you can kind of peek down. And we asked our friends that we had dinner with in Greece if they knew about this, because we knew it was here and we still had a tough time finding it, because it's really hard to find the one little spot to look over, because there's a lot of other features and a lot of people. They didn't even know about it. So again, I think about how many people in modern day Greece, whether it's uh, residents or tourists, walk right by and don't even know the history that is right there. Um, I mentioned the subways help them discover a lot of different things, so you'll actually find a lot of like little mini museums in the subways. And then, of course, in Athens, we have the Neoclassical Athenian Trilogy. So neoclassical, meaning modern, newer versions of the classical architecture. So for those of you that are architects, Architecture majors are interested in that. Um, the first of the buildings here is the Academy, which uh, has both um, uh, Apollo and Athena kind of watching above, and Socrates and Plato on the ground. So kind of fitting that we had the gods and a couple of the Greek philosophers here associated with the Academy. And then uh, the second building in the trilogy is the University of Athens that looks kind of like some of the temple features um, from the Acropolis. And the third is the National Library that's uh, famous for this kind of circular staircase. Um, so fun fact, this one kind of blew my mind. I remember exactly sitting in my office when this, I read about this and I, I just kind of had this aha moment like, oh my gosh, I've never thought about this before. But library and books and Greek language. This, the library is supposed to have the oldest book written in the Greek language. The word alphabet actually comes from Greece, right? Because the first two letters of the alphabet are alpha and beta, right? Well, yeah, I was 53 years old when I learned this fun fact. Okay, um, and again, uh, you'll hear a lot of things talk about Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian style uh, columns, which kind of help date if you're like, to me, old is old, so it's hard to kind of know the difference between this old and that old, but uh, for those that like architecture, there is a big difference, and this kind of helps um, advance you through what kind of time period. And of course, I could not talk about Athens without talking about the Acropolis. Uh, the Acropolis, of course, is probably most known for the Parthenon. Acropolis means city on a hill. And oftentimes people will call the Parthenon the Acropolis, but it's actually a building on top of the Acropolis. And Acropolis is not specific to Athens. It's probably one of the most well-known Acropolises, or Acropoli, I'm not sure. Um, but it is uh, probably the most famous. So the Parthenon, I, again, this fun little 3D, what it might have looked like. Um, but again, it's not the only thing up there. So we also have uh, the uh, Erechtheon there that have the columns that look like women, um, the Karatid porch, I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, the Propylaea and the Temple of Athena Nike are also up there. The Propylaea is like the grand staircase that the Pathenians, uh, Panathenaic procession would lead to, and it's just this grand, grand area. Um, and of course, we have a couple of historic theaters um, that influenced even modern day theater. If it weren't for the Greek playwrights, we might not have actors. Um, we just had choruses that would tell stories. So the Greek uh, playwrights or poets actually introduced an actor, then introduced a second actor that could actually have a dialogue, and then an additional actor. So over time, these things were added, and actually a set um, before things were kind of like impromptu or kind of mobile, right? So the idea of a theater was kind of uh, new, and then we got sets and more elaborate costumes and mega phones to help project and all sorts of different things that we can attribute to the Greeks. So um, the uh, Odeon of Herodus Atticus, Odeon meaning theater, is actually still used for uh, concerts and operas and different things. You can actually get tickets and go there. When we were there, they were actually getting set up for, um, I think it was an opera that night. So again, uh, very, very cool features of the Acropolis that a lot of people just associate the Parthenon and forget about those other things. But I would also highly recommend if you go to go to the Acropolis Museum because this is where it all came together. Not only could you see how it was supposed to look, you could see where it was placed. They do, uh, it's actually built to replicate the Parthenon, so it's in the same 
at the same angles and all of the reliefs and all of the work are in the exact place that it would have been on the actual building itself, of, in this case, the Parthenon. And it does actually have uh, some, uh, oh, yeah, some of the carotids, I think. And then I wanted to point this out because a lot of times we see, like the Parthenon, we see these old temples and we think they were white because that's the color they appear to us now. But in fact, they had a lot of color. And if you go to the museums, you can actually still see some of these pigments that are thousands of years old. So really amazing stuff. But of course, there's more to Greece than just Athens. So I want to introduce you to a few things that we saw uh, out around uh, Greece outside of Athens. This is the Corinth Canal. It's a isthmus, and I'm not lisping, um, that they cut through to help save uh, ships from having to go that extra 321 kilometers around the edge of Greece. Um, and again, old and new, um, it took many, many, many years to actually get it done. Um, but Amazing Race was there, and no, we didn't bungee jump, but if that's something you're interested in doing, you can still do it today. Been there, done that once. I think that was Hera's very first presentation of mine when you first came. I talked about bungee jumping in New Zealand, but I did not do it this time. Okay, so um, again, old. I think we sometimes here in the United States don't have a concept of what old is. It's kind of like, oh, old is like maybe 1900 or oh, maybe the late 1800s, right? Oh, then you start talking about like 500 and then like 500 BC, 1000 BC, 2000 BC, three, it kind of all blurs, right? Because we just don't have the structure in our brains to kind of like piece it all together. This is one of those old sites. So here, I wish I had seen this before I left because this is, I think, a great way of kind of chunking off time. So here you'll see like the Roman Empire. So that's like when Hadrian's arch was built. Uh, Hellenistic period, the Peloponnese. Here's where we had, um, well, here's the Byzantine. So these are like the churches, right? I should have started there. And now we have like the classic era with like the philosophers um, and uh, ancient uh, like buildings of like the temples and stuff. Here's where we are now. So we're like way earlier than even that. I mean, by a lot. And, and yet it's hard to kind of con conceptualize. But at My Mycenae, there are some um, important features I wanted to make sure to highlight. The Lion's Gate, again, considering how old this is, the fact that this is still in such uh, good shape, and you can kind of see that like the it was triangular, so there's a lot of architectural pieces that we can contribute to the mathematicians who knew how to design things um, to fit and last and do more than just you know, build up. Oh, by the way, I put a lot of these stuff on because I'm going to use this in my class, so my students are going to have to go back and read some of this. So I know that you're probably, hopefully, not trying to read all of that in, in one sitting here. But um, I, I, like I said, I, I think it's important to have some context, so I did that for my students. Um, a couple other things about Mycenae is the treasury of Atreus. Any of you English majors out there? Oh, OK, one. You probably know the name Agamemnon, or if you're a theater person in Greek uh, theater, you might know the name Agamemnon. Um, this is a tomb of Ag Agamemnon was here. And again, a kind of cool thing, uh, this spot right here, again, is the roof. It's a conical, conical building that by smaller, smaller pieces, uh, and the one spot goes on top, that's called the keystone. It's the part that holds it all together, it locks it all into place. So again, we use that term keystone, but we might not know the history of where it really came from, so kind of cool stuff. Uh, this area is also olive country, so it's kind of fun to drive through uh, all of these olive groves and, uh, of course, like just the quality of olives and olive oils and the variety of olives that you can get there is amazing. And Next. Olympia, that was supposed to kind of be the Olympic theme. Boom. Okay. 
Anyway. Okay, so uh, just trying to break it up a little bit, make it a little bit more fun. Olympia, um, again, probably one of my highlights, but it's a huge complex. I could do a two hour presentation just on this facility, like everything I've presented on. I'm like just barely touching on things, which is why I'm going like at the speed of light almost, right? It's because I want to get through all this to just give you a taste because there's just so many cool things and Olympia is definitely one of those cool things. Again, this one had a large, large temple. This one might have been, I think, the largest temple um, in Greece, uh, or one of the largest, um, but maybe that was the other temple of Zeus. But again, it had a big one, because Zeus was the big god, right? So there were a lot of temples to him. Uh, the Parthenon was um, Athena, because Athena was kind of associated with Athens. Huh? Athens, Athena, okay. um, but uh, you can see the size of the columns there. They're huge, it's just monstrous. Um, another important feature here is the temple of Hera. Um, this was, Hera was Zeus's wife in Greek mythology, right? But this is important for even today's modern Olympics because this is where the torch gets lit. So outside of the temple of Hera, you'll see that this is kind of a picture from old days, but they still do this now. Like you can even go on and see videos on YouTube. Um, I just watched one from the Tokyo Olympics where the torch was lit using that silver device that I showed you in one of the original pictures, using the sun's rays to light the torch, and that torch then goes by person, by boat, by wherever, to get to whoever is hosting the Olympics for that year. This is where it all starts. Pretty cool. Um, but of course, one of my highlights was the stadium. So uh, again, the archway there that, to think about the ancient athletes that took that same path and ran that same route of the starting line. It blows my mind to think about. And the fact that I walked where Socrates and Plato walked, I mean, that was back in the Agora, right? But I mean, like time and names and history, it's just, it's amazing. So this is still out in the open. They allow you to go out there. So we actually got to run the stadium like the Olympians. Okay, amazing. That was the starting line. Um, again, fun little fact about Greek words. Stadium was built to be exact measurements of a stade, hence where we get the word stadium. People that come to watch the events that happen on the stade. Um, of course, uh, there is a museum. Almost all of these places had a museum that had, again, I could talk a long time about the special features inside the museum, but um, I won't. But just know that they are there and you should go through them. Okay, so onwards to other parts of Greece. We went to Naflio, which is the old capital of Greece. Beautiful, quaint little town, cobblestone roads with cats, of course. Um, there's actually a castle. We didn't get up there, so next trip. Zayla I'm, Zayla, I'm holding you to uh, bringing us up there next time we come. Um, and of course, Byzantine churches. So uh, one of the famous churches here is St. George, um, which eh, I wish, I, I think I was just a little tired um, and I didn't quite catch us or I was too busy taking photos, but one of Da Vinci's students or a student of Da Vinci actually painted a replica of the Last Supper. And that's all I got of it is a little halo of Jesus. Okay, but um, if you go, and I, I think you should, it's one of the most romantic cities in Greece, according to stuff online. Um, but it really is cool and beautiful. But um, the Byzantine churches, just with the ornate uh, details that are like in things like the, I have to get this right, iconostasis, icon iconostasis. I always say it wrong, but it's the big altar in Greek Orthodox churches. So much detail um, that you could spend um, hours just examining each one. We also went to Nafpaktos, um, which for, again, my one English instructor here um, might be known um, for this next person, Cervantes. Um, Cervantes participated in the battle of, at that time, it was Lepanto. So they actually have this like little uh, tribute to him right by the harbor, and I just kind of stumbled upon it, and I thought it was way, way cool. Um, Again, like there's just so much to Greece, um, but I can't talk about Greece without highlighting Delphi. Um, this is probably, again, another name that most of you probably recognize because of the Temple of Apollo, but you might know it as the Oracle. Um, Pythia was the name of the person that would kind of foretell the futures or kind of uh, give advice or uh, tell 
what they thought was going to happen, but supposedly it was said in a way that kind of could go different directions and you could read into it more, like after, with hindsight, oh, well, that's what she meant. But um, in mythology, there is a lot of connections here, and again, huge, huge temple up in the beautiful mountains, and has more to it than just that one temple. It was a huge complex that included the sanctuary of Athena, where people would stop and just get ready before going up to the temple. And this one, uh, mythology where uh, Zeus sent eagles off to the east and off to the west and decided that where they would meet would be the center of the world. So he dropped a stone to mark that spot of the center, like the belly button. And so it happened to be at the temple of Delphi. This is supposedly the center of the world. Um, they also had a stadium up there uh, where games were held. These were the Pythian games. There were four games. The Olympics were only held once every four years because the athletes would go to different cities on those other years. One of those years was here for the Pythian games. So this is the best shot I had of the stadium, so you get to have us in the foreground there. But um, the stadium itself is, uh, again, they did a great job of renovating it, but um, not the only thing there. Again, here's a huge theater. This is the... Uh, whole area the complex is devoted to Apollo. Apollo was the god of music and arts and artistry. So there were a lot of music contests here. And in fact, some of the, or if not the first recorded compositions pounded out into stone. Like, think about that. Of course, we didn't have musical staffs forever, right? Music had to start somewhere. This is where it started. It's kind of crazy. And if you go to my blog, you can actually hear replications of the Delphic hymns, which these stones represent. And of course, some other cool things in the museum. <sighs> okay, because not everybody's cat lover, I know. but. Okay, so um, of course I couldn't talk about Greece without talking about Meteora. Um, it is a bunch of monasteries that are up in the cliffs, just stunning. Um, we visited two, there's only a handful of them left and they're only open certain days, so we got to two, St. Barbara's Nunnery, which is actually also a monastery, um, and the Monastery of Varlam. Again, they're just amazing to think about uh, the Greek Orthodox churches and how uh, they were trying to get closer to God by being up higher in the sky. And of course, the islands. We were lucky to hit two islands, Mykonos, which is known for its kind of island vibe. And oh, look, okay, gotta go back, spot the cat. Okay. Um, and the old town, uh, churches, cobblestones, little Venice um, with the cute, quaint little spots to eat and restaurants, also has beaches and, of course, has some monasteries. But, of course, we found the craft brewery, too. So this is no way endorsed by the college, but uh, we do like to do craft breweries um, wherever we go. And I had to take this photo here on the right because there's only, like, 20 stickers. And in, in the entire world of craft breweries, What's up there but Bent Paddle? So like major shout out to our friends up north in Duluth. Okay, Mykonos is known for the windmills and of course the sunsets. That happened to be the sunset out of our hotel room. And take note, I just noticed this this morning, that tree that looks like it's like blown over, that is so appropriate because like it was windier than all get out while we were there. I mean, it is normally windy, but it was crazy windy. Um, okay, so Delos, again, so many things, so much history. Delos is right here. It was known as the center. They thought the islands revolved around it, but it's the birthplace of Apollo and Artemis. Has some cool features like this theater and those things. And of course, um, another like little mountain point where you can climb and get a beautiful view of the Cycladic Islands. Um, and no better way to end our trip than in Santorini. Santorini is actually on a caldera, which is kind of moon-shaped, like from the volcano, so that's what it looks like. Stunning, absolutely gorgeous, but of course it also has history. So this is kind of like Greece's Pompeii, an entire village. They don't even know how big it is because they don't have enough money to renovate it, but it's all covered in ash. There were no bodies, so they think people got out of the way before like major stuff happened, but it's just like everything is so 
fine and detailed. It's hard to like preserve it, but they still got like vases and old bed frames, like crazy, like 3000 years BC, right? Crazy. Uh, Santorini is also known for its unique wine because of the volcanic ash and the way that the wine grows in these kind of circular round uh, baskets. They also have black beaches that are totally gorgeous. And of course, charming little towns and although Megalocori and uh, Fira are known uh, for being in Santorini, probably the star I would say is Ia. It looks like Oya, but it's actually Ia. And it's the best place to watch the sunset but even after the sun sets, Santorini is absolutely magical. And all of this is why I think Greece is a majestic place. Thank you, and holy cow. Like seriously, I cut out tons of slides just to make it in this much time, and I know I still spoke fast, but we actually might be in the works of putting a trip together to go back to Greece. So if you are interested in possibly um, being a part of this or at least getting more information, um, there are pieces of paper up here on the stage. You can please sign your name and your email, and I will try to keep you posted with um, what develops of that. Um, but I did say I was going to give you that QR code again, so if you are interested, the blog again has a whole bunch of different links, talks more specifically about some stuff, also gets into like some other things like talking about time or the other things that we got in our culture because of uh, Greeks, uh, like umbrellas and um, talking about the golden ratio and mathematics and there's a whole bunch of stuff on there, so, so please check it out. And again, thank you for taking some time to be uh, with us here today on this gorgeous day and for sticking with me as I like sped through this presentation. But because I did, I think we have time for just a couple of questions. So are there any questions that maybe I could answer? Don't everyone rush the stage yet. It's time for Q&A. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, my great-grandfather was born in Greece and emigrated over. Nice. Born in Tripoli, Arcadia, Greece. Nice. Have you been back? To, oh, well, then you need to come on our trip, and we'll need to come a day early and, and maybe find out where that is. That is very cool. And fun fact, um, the president of CLC is uh, Greek as well, so we are trying to get her to uh, go with us on this trip. So, Yeah, question. How far is Mount Olympus from Athens? How far is uh, Olympia or the mountain? Mount Olympia. Um, well, that's a good question. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Um, if I go, yeah, it's going to take too long. You win to Stump the Teacher Award? Yeah, yep, you do. I, I kind of now consider myself a Grecophile, but I'm like new to it. And so I'm amazed at how much I actually still kind of was able to piece together, but there's so much, again, 5,000 years of stuff, right? So um, I'm sorry, I do not know, but I can try and find out for you. And While we're waiting for the next person to conjure a question, I have one. You mentioned antiquities, and yes. I know a lot of antiquities were stolen from Greece, and now Ooh. there are conversations around the world about yes. repatriating some of those antiquities. For yes. example, the British Museum has a lot of stolen art from Greece in it. Did you have any conversations about we that? We did. They do have to walk a fine line, um, our tour guides, but off uh, the record, we kind of did. Um, a lot of the stuff specifically from the Acropolis is held in the British Museum, and the argument goes that it was taken from Greece because Greece wasn't stable enough to protected itself. That's the quote unquote kind of rationale. Well now a lot of folks in Greece are saying, hey, we're good to go, please let us have our stuff back. And they're like, no, I don't know, it kind of looks good in our museum. So um, it, it is uh, something that uh, does get discussed, but in certain circles, but I think the majority of people are probably leaning on the side that yeah, it's Greek, it belongs in Greece. Thank you, Kari. Thank you for asking. Diane, did you look up how far away Mount Olympus was? I like to prioritize. I saw students. you on your phone. Any student questions? Any questions? Come on, y'all. About 270 miles. About 270 miles is how far Mount Olympus is from <laughs> Athens. Thank you. It's knowable. I just pulled that out of my head. No. Any other questions? 
Yeah. There we go. Jan. There you go, Jan. It's not a question so much as a comment. I'm so excited at your excitement about the antiquities and the age. And um, I just got back from Spain with a nine-year-old and a 13-year-old. And I kept thinking, don't you get how old this stuff is? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you know, I, I have to say that was kind of a running joke for us a bit on the tour because again, we, we don't grow up understanding, I don't think understanding our own history, so it's hard for us to understand um, history from a larger perspective, right? I mean, there is tons of history right here on this earth and you know, shout out to our Native Americans whose land we are on right now, right? Um, but we, we aren't taught to stop, stop and appreciate it or think about it or to try to classify it. So even on the tour, like our tour guide would say, well, this is from the blah, 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 blah. And somebody would go, when was it? And the, the response was, oh, it's old. Like, I mean, anything be before 1500 AD, kind of all got lumped together because we just can't understand the Mycenaean age from the classical age. Well, where are the, like even as I was putting my PowerPoint together, I kind of hate to admit this, I'm like, now were the temples built at the same time that the philosophers were like you know, in the Agora? Were they really there at the same, you know? I mean, it's hard to, because to me, just old, but I kind of separate different things and I don't have that way to kind of chunk things out. And again, like, 500 years now seems like ancient to us here, right? We're back there so much, like we're in the thousands of years, not 500 years. So yeah, thank you for the comment about perspective and old. Way over here, Kimmy. Thank you. Um, there are different, uh, Okay, the question was, how is uh, the government of Greece broken down? Um, I, it's, it is a democracy. Um, they do have um, like principles where there are areas that have, I, I believe, um, that still kind of run like similar to our democracy. Um, but back in the day, there used to be 10 tribes. And so each of the tribes could have a representative and then had so many members, which of course, um, people talk about everybody had a right to participate in government. Who was really left out of that? People who weren't born in Athens and what other classification, if you had to guess? women. So we're talking males, right? But um, so there would be equal representation from each of those tribes. The tribes would come to that agora. And then they actually had from that like an executive council. And that executive council, I think was around 35 people. And they would actually stay on property. So during the like 24 hours a day, there would always be this executive committee that would be able to address any emergencies or any issues that came up. So it's kind of like, uh, it runs a little bit like our Senate and our um, House of Representatives, but um, without being able to take a break and actually staying there 24 seven. But as far as, as the current uh, government system goes, besides being a democracy, I'm not um, completely up to date on how many of what and how many different subsections of Greece there are. So I apologize for that. Who is the top dog? Oh gosh. This is really is like, I want to go back and take more time talking on my slides because I, I did not, like I prepped a lot more on the ancient stuff than the, the more current stuff and I'm very, um, I'm sorry, that's like really embarrassing to, to say I don't even know who the current leader is there. But I can tell you about Zeus and his wife Hera <laughs> and their kids. Kari, thank you so much for yeah. sharing your outstanding presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, and last slide, I'm just going to throw that up there. Uh, the Running Man is a really cool art structure at one of the metro stops. But take a look on the far left. Diane popped on the TV, and there was a Wheel of Fortune in Greek. So I thought that was kind of fun, so I had to include that. So again, thank you so much for joining us and um, for keeping me humble like on all I don't know. But again, I um, am very excited that you took your time to be here, and I hope some of you will put your names down on the pieces of paper if you're interested in a potential trip to Greece in the near future. So near future meaning like year, year and a half or so. So all right, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today. Now you can rush the stage.